Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the National Library of Australia. I'm Kevin Bradley. I'm the Assistant Director General here responsible for the collection, um, which is a grand thing to be responsible for. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on today on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I thank them for their care of the land on which we live and work and on which the library is situated. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And thank you all for joining us for this evening's Folk Fellowship presentation. The annual National Folk Fellowship is jointly supported by the National Folk Festival and the National Library of Australia. It offers a unique opportunity for the recipient to discover, explore, and use in their own artistic work the original collected folklore and related material held here at the National Library. Tonight, after a forced hiatus, and I can't tell you how much it hurts to have that hiatus, and I'm sure you all feel exactly the same, but after a forced hiatus, to which we were starved of much music, um, thanks to COVID-19 and many ongoing border closures between Victoria and the ACT, we are very pleased to finally be able to welcome the 2020 National Folk Fellow, Luke Burns, back to the library. Performing alongside Luke tonight is the Big Scrub Revival Band. In 2019, Luke spent four weeks at the library investigating the musical heritage and folklore of the Northers Rivers region of New South Wales. And uh, I personally found this a really exciting uh, topic and a region to look at. It's been an area which um, much has been, uh, much as in our collection has been documented in which um, such people as the library's consultant on folklore in the 1980s and 90s, uh, the late Dr Edgar Waters, was born and raised and was continually attracted to in his, in his research. Tonight, Luke will share his research into the songs, yarns, poetries and folk stories that he discovered, as well as reveal how he has reinterpreted these original recordings into contemporary compositions arranged for a seven-piece ensemble. So, Please join me in welcoming to the stage Luke Burns and the Big Scrub Revival Band. I didn't know any other children or anything else other than old time. And I still don't like modern music. I can't abide the modern music. And I still love the old time music. And I still love the music. And I still love the old time music. And I still love the old time music. And sometimes I be afraid for fear it's all going to pass away. And that'll be the end of it. And it's a great pity that is, that's if that happens. But it seems like it, but even lately I noticed some of the younger ones seem to be uh, the bush bands and things, they seem to be reviving it a little bit.
Welcome everyone and thanks again for coming tonight. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this project was developed on the lands of the Bundjalung, the Gumbangya, the Yagul, the Rwandri, the Nanawa, the Nambri, and the Nambri Gummel people. Uh, none of the land on which this album was created has ever had its sovereignty ceded by its First Nations people, and therefore this land remains stolen and occupied by colonial Australia. This land will remain unlawfully occupied until a meaning tre meaningful treaty can be negotiated, guarantees Indigenous sovereignty. I'm just going to place these here over the places we now call the Northern Rivers, Melbourne, Canberra and Australia. Uh, within the context of a presentation on folk music from the Northern Rivers, I'd also like to acknowledge that the Bundjalung, the Gumbangya and the Yagul cultures have one of the oldest surviving folk traditions on earth. And despite colonial attempts to extinguish those cultures' language and music, those traditions continue to thrive and those songs continue to be sung within those communities. I'd also like to provide a cultural warning to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people watching that this presentation will contain names, images and voices of deceased persons. Um, the voice you just heard before this song, before we came on, uh, was the voice of Kathleen McCoy. She was an accordion player who lived around the Clarence region on Gumbangi country, towards the southern end of the region that I'll be defining as the Northern Rivers. Um, I'll come back to talk about Cathy and the piece we just played in a moment, but first I'd like to give some broader context to what this project is about, how I did it, and why, in the first instance, I thought it would be good, a remotely good idea <laughs> to put together a brand new seven-piece string band to play across three different states in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> um, so, this project will, as the title suggests, explore folk music and folklore from the Northern Rivers regions of New South Wales. So the first thing to try and flesh out is what is the Northern Rivers? Um, the word Northern Rivers is perhaps a little bit misleading in terms of geography because looking at it in the context of a continental map, it definitely looks more like the Middle Rivers rather than the Northern Rivers. Um, its name is partly a colonial construct that conglomerates a bunch of rivers in the top corner of the colony of New South Wales. However, I don't believe that the ontology of Northern Rivers is completely arbitrary or else I wouldn't be doing this project. Um, it's got some pretty prominent geographical boundaries etched out by the coastline to the east, the border ranges to the north, the New England tablelands to the west, and the Dorogo Plateau to the south. The region also possesses a distinctive cultural heritage defined by the different groups of the Bundjalung, Gumbangi, and Yagul nations. And following colonisation, the region has experienced a series of shared economic and cultural shifts, resulting from a series of migrational waves to the area, ranging from the first cedar cutters that were brought in by the lure of red gold, to the pastoral and agricultural exploits of the region throughout the 19th and 20th century, and to the more recent counterculture movement that has gifted the area its contemporary Rainbow Region moniker. So, those are the regional parameters that I set for myself for this project. And the next thing I'd like to talk about is what inspired me to do this project. Uh, I embarked on this journey in an attempt to understand the historical and cultural heritage of my home in greater depth. I grew up in the region and my family has lived in the region now for over seven generations. Sorry, for exactly seven generations. <laughs> so fundamentally, I see the Northern Rivers, its people, its places, as a concept that shaped both myself and many of those I love. And so I wanted to know more about what had shaped it. My interest in traditional music and field recordings intersected with my attachment and love for my home in the Northern Rivers. And so I decided to apply for this fellowship to explore the region through the lens of folk music. And to my disbelief, I was granted the National Folk Fellowship. Um, just a big shout out to the National uh, Library's fellowship team for taking a massive gamble on a bluegrass punk from the Northern Rivers. Um, <laughs> I hope it pays off. <laughs> um, so my preliminary and slightly delusional fantasy that I would unearth a secret collection of recordings revealing a clearly de delineated Northern Rivers folk tradition uh, very quickly collapsed. Um, Instead, I found myself rummaging through fragmented and conflicting stories that included such things as railway navvies going strike at Bex Hill for better wages, Gumbanya fiddle players teaching their daughters to step dance at Razorback, environmental activists singing songs from the Terrania Creek blockade and lighting up spliffs in the middle of an interview for the National Library's archives, <laughs> Bundjalung pastors fighting against simulation at Kabui, Early colonisers of broad meadows exhibiting right, white fragility when reflecting on the tenuous nativity to the land that they occupy. Local musicians bringing rural communities together for dances at Nude and Boyd, and those same families along the Boyd River ostracising one another due to interracial marriage. Old drovers living near the Aurora River, telling ghost stories and talking about early transgender identities. Yagel songwriters at Yamba singing teasingly about their friend's search for love at Yugal Bar. 
The first hippie commune, led by a false messiah outside of Mullumbimby, composers from Nimboida writing locally inspired waltzes and commemorating folk gatherings within the area, and countless more regional tales and tunes that evoke both celebration and shame for my home. Uh, my attempt to tell a neat, conclusive narrative of the Northern Rivers through music proved as impossible as an attempt to bail out the Richmond River with a bucket. Um, instead, this project developed into more of a collage, and my aspirations for this performance are to present just a few of the many different pales that I drew from the never-ending stream of Northern Rivers stories in hopes of inspiring a richer appreciation for the region's complex history and culture. Uh, the music created for this project and the stories and context behind them were largely drawn from field recordings taken from the Northern Rivers that are now stored in the oral history department of the, this library, or whatever that department is now called after the library restructure. Um, I drew heavily upon recordings collected by Dave DeHugard, Chris Sullivan, Rob Willis, Margaret Gummo, Jennifer Gall, Marjorie Oakes, Russell Ward, Edgar Waters, and John Gordon. The Northern Rivers is an area that I believe was unfortunately underappreciated during the Australian folk revival. I've asked some of the collectors that I mentioned previously about their thoughts on why the area wasn't explored as much as other regions in New South Wales. And there are a few answers. Perhaps the, perhaps the area was not seen as rural enough and therefore didn't fit the national Australian bush narrative that folklorists were trying to construct at the time. And also perhaps the region was just too far away from Sydney for urban folk collectors to bother to make the drive up. Uh, thankfully, however, there was enough material in the available collections to piece together not just one album, but several, and it became a difficult process of selection to choose what to perform for both the album and this presentation. For this presentation, I've made a selection of songs and tunes with the intention of trying to exhibit a broad canvas of Northern Rivers folk music. And the first tune from this selection was the tune that we just played, which was learnt from the accordion playing of Kathleen McCoy and was collected by Dave DeHugard. Uh, Kathleen McCoy was an accordion player who lived around the Clarence region of the Northern Rivers in Gumbanya country. She was born on the 11th of June 1901 and she inherited her musical gifts. I'm just going to see if I can work this slide. There we go. I've got it. All right, that was a good test run. Um, she was born on the 11th of June 1901 and she inherited her musical gifts from her parents Harold Didden and Charlotte Brown, as well as her grandmother Mary Ann Monaghan, all of whom were prominent musicians in the Clarence Valley region. Playing button accordion, and piano accordion from the age of 13, Cathy learned most of her repertoire from her mother and grandmother, and she attributed her style of playing directly to these early influences, insisting, I stick to the way that my parents play because they were the old, old timers, and that's what I think is right. Uh, the piece we just played was a nameless tune. However, after playing the tune, Cathy remarked that that was the first tune I learned to play, and I thought I was Christmas on a stick after I played that. Um, and so in light of that conversation, I named the, the tune as Cathy's first tune. However, Unbeknownst to me, it had already been titled by the collector Dave DeHugard as Christmas on a Stick, so for this project we've retained both titles. Um, Kathy's first tune, or Christmas on a Stick, was passed on to Kathy McCoy by her mother, Charlotte Didden, who used to play for the second figure of a popular square dance at the time, the Lancers. The Lancers were a global square dancing phenomenon, and the tunes that were originally composed for the Lancers were often lost during the process of transplantation, as the dance travelled from Europe to rural New South Wales. Uh, and so the dancers accompanying music in this transplantation process was instead usually replaced by tunes that musicians knew locally. This track is one such example of this local process of transmutation taking place, with the originally intended tune being replaced by a piece Charlotte and Kathy had learnt locally by ear. Conceptually, I often like to think of set dancers, as provide, such as the Lancers, as providing the black and white outlinings of sketching with the accompanying tunes breathing life into and colouring the black and white figures outlined in that sketch. In this way, one could think of Cathy and Charlotte dyeing a global dance phenomenon with a selection of local melodic colours drawn from a unique palette of music circulating the Northern Rivers at the time. Uh, the next tune I'd like to present to you is a piece called Uncle Billy's Hornpipe. Um, and with this piece, I'd really like to elaborate more on the creative process that I took in arranging this album and this project. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the original tune, which you'll hear now, and then take you through the process. Thank you. 
Okay, great. So that was the original piece, um, and now I'm going to demonstrate how I translated that accordion uh, arrangement into a fiddle tune. I'm going to let Grace show the first step of the process, which is translating the accordion melody into a fiddle melody. Take it away, Grace. So Uh, version of the process that I went through in arranging these tunes with these folks. Um, so the piece that you heard, which we'll play in full next, is called Uncle Billy's Hornpipe. And it was learned from the accordion player of Laurie Cobley, who you heard before, um, who was a nephew of Uncle Billy Muskie, the namesake of this tune. So Laurie Cobley was born in 1961, 61, sorry, 1916, and lived around the Clarence Valley region. He learned this and many other tunes in his repertoire from the playing of his Uncle Billy. A notoriously gifted fiddle player, button accordionist, mouth organ player, and tin whistle player who lived near Razorback Creek just off the Boyd River. The Maskies and the Cobblies both lived together on the shared family property at Razorback. And during his interviews, Laurie recalled many local musicians gathering from around the area to play at the Maskies' house while camping and fossicking on the creeks around Razorback. And it was during these gatherings that Laurie learned most of his tunes. Billy Maskey, or Uncle Billy, was born in 1889 and lived most of his life in a three-bedroom bedroom wooden house that he built and resided in with his wife, his 14 children, and his grandmother, Jane Maskey. Uh, Billy was highly regarded within the wider community, and Kathleen McCoy, the, verse, the voice of who you heard at the start of this presentation, praised Uncle Billy's talents, saying he was the most musical person you could see, and they always had him up there for dances. And Laurie, Uncle Billy's nephew, also asserted that when it came to musical gatherings, Uncle Billy was the boss. Um, unfortunately for us, Uncle Billy was never recorded. However, his tunes live on through the collective recordings of his nephew, Laurie, and his influence is exhibited in the number of unique and interesting tunes within Laurie's repertoire that bear Billy's name, such as Uncle Billy's Waltz, Uncle Billy's Funny Waltz, <laughs> Uncle Billy's Step Tune, and of course the piece we're about to play called Uncle Billy's Hornpipe. Um, Uncle Billy himself was the son of an Englishman, William Maskey, and a Gumbangya woman, Jane Gard. His mother's racial identity was a subject of wild speculation in the area. As a young girl, she was separated from her parents and adopted by a white family and subsequently exploited by them as a young girl servant. William and Jane were ostracized by the rest of the white Maskey family due to the discriminatory stigma around inter interracial marriages. Their son, Uncle Billy, having been labeled a half-caste, confronted racism from his own family and the broader community. In spite of this, Uncle Billy was active in all aspects of community life around him and made spirited con contributions to the social and cultural fabric of the area through his music and dance. Billy Maskey also had a fascinating connection with Kathleen McCoy, the voice you heard at the start. Uh, Kathleen and Billy were related as in-laws through Kathy's great-grandfather, Henry Brown, who had married Billy Maskey's auntie, Eliza Maskey. However, it seems that Kathleen McCoy, despite her extensive knowledge of family connections in the area, was unaware of this relationship probably due to Eliza ostracising her brother William after he decided to marry Billy's mother Jane. Billy Maskey also shared an existential connection to Cathy McCoy after he saved her from drowning in the Boyd River. Cathy was crossing the river with her mother in a sulky on the way to Newton Boyd during a flood and after her mother misjudged the depth of the stream, Cathy was swept off the back of the sulky and plunged into the floodwaters. Thankfully, Billy Maskey had offered beforehand to accompany Cathy and her mother across the river and he was able to rescue Cathy from drowning by reining her in by the hair. <laughs> Saved her life, so I suppose that's a plus. Um, another important connection shared by Cathy and Billy, and the relationship by which they both drew equal admiration from each other, was through music. Uh, Billy learnt a large part of his repertoire from Cathy's mother, Charlotte Didden, 
and she taught him to play violin after he received his first fiddle at the age of 21. Billy would often play at the same dances as Kathy's mother and would accompany her fiddle, her fiddle playing with the tin whistle accordion or concertina. Because Billy and Kathleen's repertoire both stem from Charlotte Didden, it can be speculated that several of the tunes held in common within the recorded collections of Laurie Cobley and Kathleen McCoy stem from the same musical source, as Laurie Cobley drew the majority of his repertoire from his uncle Billy, Ma Billy Maskey, who in turn drew large parts of his repertoire from Kathy's mother Charlotte. We'll introduce this, this tune with a quote from Uncle Billy's daughter, Shirley Maskey. And, uh, and also, Kathy told me about, about Billy Maskey playing the music. Yeah, well, he is the, the most beautiful violin player he is, you ever heard. And he'd just play it by, by ear. He'd just play it. He'd just pick any tune if he'd hear it, he could play it. He'd just, it would just, his darling hands and fingers would just, it had little brains around and they'd just play, play, you know, play anything. <laughs> So the next tune I'd like to introduce is one called Where Are You Going, Bunny Cook? Um, and this was learnt from the singing of Alexander Cameron, who was recorded at Pippi Beach at Yamba in 1968 by John Gordon. Uh, Alexander Cameron was a Yagel man that spoke and sung in his own Yagel language. 
as well as Gumbang and Bunjilung in English. He was born in 1890 at Ulmara and grew up on the Aboriginal missionary school at Ulgandahi Island. He learned traditional corroboree songs from the elders within his community, as well as writing his own contemporary songs in local language and English. Alexander Cameron's songs are just a few examples among hundreds of recorded Indigenous folk songs that demonstrate the rich musical tradition of the Bunjilung, Gumbang and Yagal people of the Northern Rivers region. As a wealth of these recordings from the area stored in the IATSIS oral history collections, and dozens of these songs are still performed and kept in circulation across Indigenous communities throughout the region. This particular song was written by Alexander while he was visiting his friend, Bunny Cook, who lived at Cabbage Tree Island along the Richmond River. Bunny Cook was setting off to work at Yugobar Station in search of a girlfriend. And while he was departing, Alexander sang this song to remind him that if he ever did find a girlfriend, that he'd better make sure that he doesn't forget him to invite him around for wedding cake. <laughs> uh, Bunny Cook himself was a Bunjilung man and a noted musician within the Cabbage Tree Island community. Uh, Bunny was also one of the many Indigenous employers to work at Yugobar Station, which you can see on the screen here, which was a pastoral station that was set up in the Upper Clarence region by an early coloniser, Edward Ogilvie. The Yugobar Castle and its small pastoral empire is often attributed to the pioneering legend of Ogilvie. However, it should also be noted that like most early squatters, Ogilvie built his fortunes on the stolen land and wages of local Indigenous people, such as Bunny Cook. Uh, musically, Alexander's songs, Where Are You Going, Bunny Cook?, contains consistently irregular bar lengths in a similar fashion to many crooked fiddle tunes within the old time string band tradition, which is the kind of music that we play. Uh, with these musical parallels in mind, I've applied the asymmetrical structure of Alexander's vocal melody to an instrumental melody for fiddles, while also retaining the original lyrics and melody of the song. So we'll perform that for you now. We hope you enjoy it.
Cool. Thanks, folks. Um, the next tune that I'd like to play is called Reggie's Tune, which is learned from the playing of Gene Winters and was collected from Gene by Dave DeHugard. Uh, this tune was passed down to Gene, who you can see here, through our aunties and uncles without a name, and so it came to be known as Reggie's Tune after a friend of Gene's who had adopted it as his favourite tune. Gene Winters was a button accordion player that grew up around Bar Eugle and was the daughter of Priscilla Hamilton and James Rogan. She began playing tunes for the dancers at the age of eight, and I'll play a clip for you folks now where Jane talks about learning to play in her early years. I think my, my family were all uh, very musical, and I think it was just uh, something that happened. Uh, the accordion was there, and uh, one day I picked it up, and I found that I could uh, get a tune out of it. And uh, the first tune that I could ever play uh, was Moonlight and Roses. And, uh, you know, I started off just with the keys and then, uh, then I was able to add a bass to it and, and I was away. And, and I can remember playing extras for dancers when I was eight. I'd be as sleeping under the seat like most children did while their parents danced and they'd wake me up to um, provide an extra and then I'd do that and go back to sleep again. Uh, dancers those days used to last till three or four o'clock in the morning. In fact, I can remember uh, plenty of them we, uh, where they used to put bags up at the windows to uh, stop the daylight coming in so they could dance longer. Um, so another tune in the Northern Rivers that pops up with a remarkable similarity to the A section of Reggie's tune, which is the tune we're about to play, is a tune that Laurie Cobley, the person you heard about before, a tune that he played called Abadella Watts, which he learned from a local accordion player called Arthur Olive. I'm going to play for you folks an excerpt of both of these tunes so you can listen to the relationship between the two melodies. So this is Reggie's tune from the playing of Dean Winters. And then the next excerpt that I'm going to play is the playing of Laurie Cobbley. Sound familiar? I can see some heads bobbing in the audience, so it's obviously got a catch to it. Um, Right, when looking at these tunes, it's fascinating to see the creative permutations that have occurred in Northern Rivers in such a short period of time. Uh, my own creative license was also exercised when interpreting this tune, and although our arrangement re remains faithful to Jean's original melody and her embellishments, uh, the piece that we've made has been slowed down significantly and it's been reharmonized to blunt the cornier edges of the tune's A section. Um, and further explore the meandering qualities of Jean's B unique section in greater depth. So this is Reggie's Waltz. Um, and we'll have
Thanks, folks. Um, the next piece that I want to introduce is a song called Native Land Waltz. Uh, Native Land Waltz was learned from the accordion player of Kathleen McCoy, who you've heard plenty of times before, um, and was collected by Dave DeHugart. Kathy learned this tune from her mother, and she recited lyrics that she recorded her mother having sung to the tune, saying, Give me home in my own native land, and a tall shady gum tree in Australia's fair land. During one particular interview, some additional words were recalled that go, give me a hut in my own native land, out in the bush where the tall gum trees stand, no matter how far in the bush that may be, with a dear native girl there to share it with me. And Cathy responded to these words by recalling a story where, her mother, where she asked her mother whether the native girl in the song would have been a dark girl. And her mother responded by rousing on Cathy, yelling, no, she wasn't. Um, I was already experiencing some discomfort around embracing a tune called Native Land Waltz, and this conversation really brought to the fore some uncomfortable questions surrounding nativity, land and race. Uh, I believe that colonial Australia has always had a fragile relationship with its connection to place on this continent. With its claim to land and nativity founded on the precarious colonial logic of white possessiveness and an etiology of settler victimhood. Uh, much of the pioneering legend of colonial Australia rests on a mythology that frames white colonisers as victims of settlement, battling through trials of adversity to build brighter futures in connection with a new land. Although these tales of adversity in early colonial history reflect a partial truth, what this narrative intentionally fails to engage with is that Australia's, colonial Australia's connection to land is fundamentally predicated on removing Indigenous people's connection to that very same land. When the supplanting society's legitimacy over holding this land and its claims to nativity are questioned, the fragility of white Australia is often exposed and responded to in anger. Whether this be Cathy's mother lashing out in anger over questions around her nativity at Newton Boyd, a series of history wars following native title claims, or residents of the Northern Rivers fuming on public forums over national holidays being brought into question. Uh, Guampal author Eileen Morton Robertson comments that Aboriginal perspectives towards colonial Australia bring into question the very formation of that nationalism, and that doesn't make Australians feel very good. And this is true. It's not a comfortable experience examining one's own connection to place. However, this process of critical reflection and truth-telling is necessary if we are to move forward together and call the Northern Rivers or any other place on this continent home with any integrity. Um, to incorporate this reflective process into the song, I've kept the original verse while adding two, origin two additional verses. Um, one of the verses recounts a story told by Pastor Frank Roberts Sr. about his father, Lyle Roberts, resisting government harassment and assimilation efforts in the Northern Rivers. While the other is a personal reflection of my own on how to reconcile my own connection to the Northern Rivers, whilst also recognising that this connection is entangled with Indigenous dispossession. Musically, the melody of this particular tune pops up in places all over the globe. Dave DeHugard recognised it after playing it with Kathleen McCoy as a Swedish tune called The Waltz, Waltz of Old. And in later years, he found another piece from the United States called Give Me a Cot in, my, in the Valley I Love that shares, a similar, shares similar lyrical themes and melodic motifs. Recently, I've identified the melody in an Acadian waltz from Canada called Waltz Aurelien Jonf. And closer to home, there are recordings of Dooley Chapman and other musicians playing this waltz across New South Wales. The melody to this tune is, as Cathy McCoy describes, very salubrious, and a reharmonisation of the B part also permits the melody to move into a more pensive temperament that hopefully allows the listener space to pause and reflect on their own particular connection to place. All right, hope you enjoy. In the 
bush that may be with the dear native girl there to share it with me where those gum stand they select and stole and what look out the country the natives called home and Kathy asked mom is that a dark girl they mean well of course not she was white dear just like you and me just like you and me Man, it's White Station Man. going to run over time, so I won't be offended if people do have to leave um, or go to the toilet and come back if you prefer to do that as well. Um, but the next piece we're going to play is called The Tweed in Lismore. 
Uh, so Tweedin Lismore is a railway ballad, and it was originally written by a railway navvy called Ned McGilgut, who's here. Uh, while working on the Tweed Lismore railway line that was built between 1891 and 1894. This section of the railway, dubbed by a local politician at the time as a line from nowhere to nowhere, was constructed as the first piece of North Coast railway aimed at connecting the isolated agricultural regions of the Northern Rivers to nearby coastal ports in Sydney. An, an old Northern Star article reports that Ned penned this ballad during a period of enforced idleness imposed on him by a flood that surrounded a railway camp at Bex Hill. I know there's a Bex Hill member in the audience, so that's the name drop that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the song came to be known by all workers along the line, and it documents the poor wages and harsh conditions that McGilligate and other workers experienced during this time at the hands of exploitative construction company bosses. Navvies such as Ned were labourers that travelled around the continent seeking work on large-scale civil engineering projects, such as the Tweed to Lismore railway line. Their employment was often precarious and they performed hard manual labour under notoriously bad conditions for low wages, um, kind of like the gig economy now. Um, <laughs> the 10 and 6 pence day wage, 10 and 6 pence a day wage, the McGilligate bemoans in the song, eventually led to an industrial dispute in November 1891, just three months into the construction of the... I am oh. I'm going to play that later. I'm going to see if I can skip... Yes, I can do it. Okay. The 10 and 6 pence a day wage that McGilligate bemoans in the song eventually led to an industrial dispute in November 1891. And you can see the, the newspaper articles that were written about that strike. Uh, just three months into the construction of the railway, this song constructs a damning working class counter narrative to what was printed in the press at the time about the railway construction company, Carol and Carol. McGilligate's fierce disdain for the railway boss is made clear at the end of the song when he says, Carol himself is a rotten old bore. And this scathing description stands in stark contrast to the character profile ascribed to the railway boss, Harry Carroll, by a newspaper obituary that stated, his business activities were always characterized by uprightness and probity. And while he was one willing and anxious to meet on fair grounds, he would always stand up for what he thought was right and proper. Uh, unfortunately, Carroll subscribed to the same capitalist logic that exists today, which sees exploitation of human labour as right and proper. Um, our version of the song was adopted from a field recording taken by Russell Ward and Edgar Waters of Ned McGilligate's son, Paddy McGilligate, who was recorded singing the tune near Korokai in the 1950s. The recording features Paddy singing nine verses unaccompanied, and I'll play a selection, section of the field recording for you folks to give you an idea of how the original sounded, which is what came on, on this slide. There we go. I am a navvy that works everywhere, east, west, north, and south, I vow and declare. Such terrible misfortune I ne'er had before, and we had on that railway the tweed and Lismore laddie, piled a bit of lair a la 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 There's many male verses after that, so don't worry, we're going to perform them all. <laughs> all right. The melody that the ballad is sung to is derived from the 19th century whaling song called Paddy and the Whale. And it is likely that this melody would have been brought over from Europe when Ned's father moved the McGilligate family over to this continent from Glen Limerick in Ireland in 1865. Sonically, it can be very challenging to sustain interest in a nine verse ballad. Um, and in this arrangement that we've created, our intention was to move progressively through a series of different string band textures so as to engage the listener over the course of an eight minute epic. Uh, so strap yourselves in. Uh, we've also slowed the tempo of the song down for some increased melodrama and our bass player Francis Evans took this arrangement into true prog folk territory when she laid the foundations of a dreamlike string and mandolin interlude midway through the song. Uh, we hope you enjoy this rendition. Worked everywhere East, west, north and south I vow and declare 
Such terrible misfortune I ne'er saw before As we had on that brow way The Tweed and Lismore Bloody fall the diddle erol all erol all well, me and Bill Ali came up from the south To see if we could get some cuts to take out Oh Carol he promised us cottons galore On the side of that railway Tweed and Lismore, bloody fall the diddle arrow, all arrow, all
was in it, our credit ran high. If not by my soul, sure, a lot might have died. The people from Queensland come down be the score, seeking work on that railway between and with four. Bloody fall, the diddle arrow, oh, arrow, oh, me. And now. Two more songs. I promise we get out of here by whatever that is, 7:30. Um, so the next song I want to play for you folks is uh, called "Let's Go Down." A song called "Let's Go Down the Forest" that was written by Paul Joseph, the man you see here, in 1976, in preparation for the first meeting of the Terrania Native Forest Action Group. The meeting was held at a farmhouse in the Nimbin Valley, where 20 people met and decided to create a film and accompanying soundtrack to begin campaigning against the imminent logging of the last remnants of the Big Scrub, which is the namesake of this band. The campaign led to the successful halting of logging in Terrania Creek in 1979 and eventually resulted in the 1982 rainforest decision by the New South Wales State Government, where 100,000 hectares of state forest was placed under protection for timber production. Paul Joseph, the author of this song, moved to the Northern Rivers following a violent interaction with the New South Wales Police during a Vietnam War demonstration in Sydney. After moving to the region, Paul leveraged his musical gifts along with his desire for radical change, to become an integral part of the Northern Rivers counterculture community. Where he assisted in organising the 1973 Aquarius Festival, he helped establish the Tunnable Creek community, facilitated the collectivisation of Nimba's cultural infrastructure, and aided the formation of the Terrania Creek protest movement. Uh, I just want to play a clip of Paul Joseph singing the song at the Terrania Forest Blockade to give context to what the original song would have sounded like. <laughs> Um, oh, I'll save that for later. For our version of the song, I've changed the eclectic folk style you heard before uh, and moved it into a bluegrass aesthetic with some accompanying instrumental breaks in the beginning, middle and end of the piece. I've also added a verse and chorus of my own to reflect my own experiences in contemporary environmental direct action campaigns. Unfortunately, the logging of native and remnant forests still occurs throughout this country and in this presentation I wanted to connect these stories of past forest blockades in the Northern Rivers uh, to current actions being taken in the region and the country at large. So I asked my friend Ziana, who's currently at Camp Nungu on Gumbungi country near Bellingen, 
if she could make a video for the audience today to let folks know about a forest blockade happening right now in the north coast at Newry State Forest. And here is Sienna. Hello, my name's Sienna and I'm on Gambangia country in the beautiful Newry State Forest. This is the next forest under threat from Forestry Corporation New South Wales. It's a really biodiverse, koala-rich forest that's incredibly significant to the Gimbangir people. So the communities come together and we've set up a camp called Camp Nungu. It's a blockade where elders have given a full invitation to bring as many people in as we can to stand up for Nuri and protect this forest. As you've heard about today, this area has an incredibly rich history of forest activism and a lot of the national parks up here are testament to those last campaigns. We've had some really big wins here in the last year with Nambucca and Wild Cattle Creek and we hope that Newry will be the next on the list. Thanks, Deanna. Um, if you'd like to support or get involved with Camp Nungu Blockade, uh, you can find out more details on the Newry Native Forest State... Sorry, Newry Native Forest Blockade website. I um, also just want to mention that I wrote and recorded these lyrics in response to the 2019-2020 Black Summer fires. And you can see the damage that the fires caused around Terrania Creek here in this video that I took during that summer when we went out to help them. Yeah. Turn the volume down because it's got some miscellaneous speech of me that may be a little bit rude. Um, uh, in this video that I took during the summer when we went out to help make some fire breaks to prevent the fires spreading from uh, into the Tunnable Creek and Cedar Farm communities. Uh, the lyrics I wrote for this song and our version of it uh, talk about the need for broader economic and structural changes to address the climate crisis that is driving these fires. Uh, unfortunately, capitalism and a healthy planet cannot coexist. Um, so this is our version of Let's Go Down the Forest. And I'm going to play so you can see here um, that very same forest that was protected uh, when the song was written has been completely burnt. Uh, but we're going to play with a little happier backdrop behind us, which is the forest action taken to protect uh, the Terrania Creek native forest. Nature has known harmony Far beyond 
Let's go down to the forest Let's go save our old friends the trees Learn to live together with the forest And save some for our children, please So the next tune and the last tune in the set um, is a tune called The Train Won't Run to Mwollomba, and it was learned from the playing of Len Duncan. Len was a nephew, oh, and the tune was also collected by Chris Sullivan. Uh, Len was a nephew of Bob and Huey Duncan, and the two uncle, well, who are the two uncles who were attributed authorship of this tune and its lyrics. And it can be seen here on the right of this picture. Uh, Bob and Huey Duncan made a living as timbermen, and they operated a bullock team delivering goods between Beachmont, Gilston, and the train line in Narang. Both uncles lived their lives together in the same shared house and their nephew Sid Duncan recalled regular congregations of people gathering at their home on a Sunday to step dance along to Bob and Huey's music. Uh, the tune itself that we're about to play appears to be a transplanted German polka picked up by Bob and Huey Duncan from around the region. Len, their nephew, recalled that both he and his uncles often shared the stage to play dances with German musicians in the region. And recently, Maria Zahn sent me another German tune collected in southeast Queensland from Percy Spann called, and I'm going to stuff this pronunciation up, Per Kartoffeln Leibenwurst, Leibenwurst, translated Potatoes and Liverwurst, uh, which shares the same melody and onomatopoeic refrain that define both tunes, which you'll hear in a moment. The railway lines referred to in the song are the Queensland South Coast railway line that terminated at Tweed Heads and the Tweed Lismore line that terminated at Mwollomba. The New South Wales government refused to fund an extension between Mwollomba and Tweed Heads because, as the state government said at the time, it was not in the interest of the state that the line should be constructed, as the chief result of it would be to enable Queensland to compete with New South Wales for the general merchandise and business of the Tweed and Richmond di districts. So Bob and Huey Duncan would have been acutely aware of this railway gap and the squandered interstate markets that resulted from it as they supplied trade to rail freight through their bulk driving team. Um, in our arrangement of this piece, I've saturated the tune with a flurry of passing tones to fill the melodic gaps in the original tune. And I've added several instrumental breaks to transform the slightly dorky original German polka into an old time breakdown banger. <laughs> I've also added an additional verse that touches on another transport issue plaguing the region at the time, the hazardous entry to the Richmond River at Ballina. The first vessel to be wrecked at the Richmond Bar was John Skinner's Urara, uh, in the 1850s, sorry, Urara, uh, with countless numbers of craft and life, life lost thereafter, as you can see in these pictures. Uh, this was just a small handful from, of pictures from one book. Um, this was also a song that was helped out on the recording of the album by the gang vocal talent of the National Library's own oral history department. And you can see Fiona, Mark, Eva and Duncan really giving it their all here. Um, thanks a lot for that, <laughs> Fiona and Duncan. <laughs> Um, so, before we'd like to finish, I uh, just wanted to let you know that if you'd like to listen to more of these tunes and more uh, oral history department gang vocals, um, we have a CD available to purchase. Uh, and it contains more than twice the amount of tracks that we've been able to squeeze in this, small, in this performance this evening. Um, and apologies in advance for the shameless me social media plug, but uh, we'd also really appreciate if all those watching today could go and follow the Big Scribe Revival on Facebook and Instagram page, because this is our second only show. It's our first amplified show. Um, so we've got a lot more coming up, and it'd be great if you could all follow that. Uh, the artwork here is done by Polly Bastow and Sophia Sabah, and I've also written a 24-page booklet included with the CD that explores the context and history behind the music that we play. Uh, the CD is for sale for $25. We're sending half of the money made from the album to the Murray Bay Aboriginal Language and Cultural Cooperative, which is a cooperative working to conserve and disseminate Gumbanya, Yagel and Bunjalung language and music. So money from this album will be going directly back into efforts to support Northern Rivers folk culture. Um, I'll play this and finish with some closing words after the tune. So this is Train Won't Run to Warren Bar. I'm going to swap the band, I think.
All right. So that's the last song we've got for you guys, but I wanted to wrap this up, this presentation, with a few words about my thoughts on Northern Rivers folk music and folklore as it exists today. Um, this will be very brief. Um, I believe the folk music and folklore continue to thrive in the Northern Rivers. I believe it exists in traditional folk music gatherings and sessions like those held at Woody Head, Dorigo, Barkers Vale and Lismore, but I also believe that it breathes just as deeply in the music played at anti-fracking blockades and forest blockades, in Indigenous communities and cultural centres across the region, in the drumming circles of the Chenham Markets, in the New Year's festivities of tropical fruits, in the bloom of Grafton's Jacaranda Festival, in the parades of Nimbin's Mardi Gras, in the lights of Lismore's Lantern Festival, in the community dances at Bushdoofs and, how, and <laughs> community dances at Bushdoofs held at New Italy and Whipperee, in the hardcore and punk house gatherings of Lismore and Byron Bay, and anywhere else in the Northern Rivers where music and culture exist in service to the community in which it is practiced. Um, it is my hope that this project will contribute an additional thread to this rich tapestry of Northern Rivers folk life. Um, I'd like to thank my band for joining me on this journey over the last year. Can we get a massive round of applause for Grace Bigby on the fiddle? Uh, Felicity Law on the other fiddle. Claire Alloway on the cello. Uh, Francis Evans on the biggest fiddle. Uh, Lily Hodgkins on the banjo. Jess Bell on the mandolin and guitar. Um, and this is the image I'll leave you with. Uh, this is a picture of my mum's place, mum and dad's place in Kanaiba. Um, my baby nephew Finn. Uh, who always try to sneak in photo opportunities wherever I can. Um, I wanted this picture to accompany the closing thank you that I wish to make, which is to the Northern Rivers community for sustaining, for continuing to sustain me. Um, after travelling the East Coast for the last 10 years, you still remain my home. Thank you. Um, thanks very much to Luke. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm, I'm so impressed with the way the complexity of the geography, the culture, uh, the whole region of, of the Northern Rivers was woven into that and the band provided such a brilliant musical backdrop to the whole thing. I think it was fantastic. Thank you. Now, I should put out, those of you who are worrying terribly, that's a heritage clock. <laughs> and, and it shows heritage time. Um, but we read to readjust back to 2021, which is about 10 minutes ago. Um, we have unfortunately run out of time for this evening. Uh, but for those of you who are interested to know, uh, the National Folk Festival um, has agreed to again partner with the National Library for next year's Folk Fellowship. And the applications are open from as of today with the closing date of the 21st of June, which is um, spread the news, let those who know it. Now, I think also in the audience is Archer Broughton. Archer? Where's Archer? There's Archer at the back. Here, Archer is this year's folk fellow who began his journey through the collection this year, and I think he's um, been impressed with what he's seen up on the stage, but we'll be seeing Arch, more from Archer in the future. So. Please thank me again in um, thank you. <laughs> Please join me again in thanking Luke Burns <laughs> and the Big Scrum Revival Band. Thank you.